You're listening to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast, episode number 32. Welcome to the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. Music tech tips, lesson ideas, advice, news and interviews, especially for music teachers. Brought to you by midnightmusic.com.au. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Music Tech Teacher Podcast. I'm Katie Wardrobe, a music technology education trainer, speaker and consultant from midnightmusic.com.au where I give music teachers simple and actionable tips for using technology in music education. It's also the home of the Midnight Music community where you can find music tech online training, courses, video tutorials, tips and personalised support. Now, the topic of today's episode is websites, in particular, setting up your own website. So I know many of you have been thinking about setting up your website or maybe you've considered it but really dismissed it in the past because you've thought that it's just way too hard or too costly or that you need to know coding. And I'm here to tell you that it's actually not that hard at all and it's I think quite a lot of fun. So I'm going to talk today about why you might want to set up your website. And this could be because as a teacher, you want to have like an online business card or an online version of your CV. So it might be just a website that talks about you and your achievements over time. You might want to have a personal blog where you write about teaching or other topics and share your ideas and lesson plans and what's worked in the classroom or what has not worked in the classroom for you. You may also, as a teacher, want to have a website to sell resources. So there might be some resources that you can actually sell or you can do some teaching yourself in an online um, setup and basically do that from your website. If you're a teachers pay teachers seller, you may also want to have a website to support what you do on the teachers pay teachers um, site itself. Now, I know a lot of sellers have their own blog or website and it can be an extra way to get attention for your products that you're selling and a place for you to write about the experience of using the activities and resources that you sell on Teachers Pay Teachers. As a performer, if you perform yourself, if you play in a duo or do some solo singing or perhaps um, work in a big band, you might also want to have a website for your group. And the last sort of area for having one yourself as a teacher might be because you want to start some kind of business. Now, students may also get involved with having their own website as well. And you as a teacher might might sort of like the students to have their own websites to use as a publishing platform. Now, this can be a great way to have a digital portfolio in an online format. So um, students can actually share work on a website themselves and use it to publish text and images and videos and audio files and so on. Now, Online publishing is actually a big part of our everyday lives. I think it's really important to contribute to the pool of information that's out there. I personally seek out information all the time online from other teachers. So I have hopes that when I'm learning something new or hear about some new education technology concept or idea or trend, I always hope that there is something that I can look for online to see more about it and, and learn you know, what it is that's so important or what works well or see examples of use. So I, I do go to Google and I look and I hope to see other teachers' um, information online. So it really takes uh, a group of teachers who are willing to do that publishing and if you yourself can contribute to that pool of information, I think it's a great thing. So I started my own website um, for a couple of reasons really. One was as a business owner, I needed somewhere online, a presence online where people could find me and see information about my business and what I do, the workshops that I run, the courses that I have and so on. And the second reason was I started a blog initially because I found that I was giving the same information frequently in workshops or in courses and it was much easier and made much more sense to publish an article about that thing online or create a video and publish that online so that I could send people to that one spot and it saved me having to explain the same thing over and over and over. 
As a business, there's also a, another side to that, the publishing of information which is relevant to my niche that I work in, being music technology and education, also attracts people to my website, which is a good thing as a business too. So that might be something that you want to get involved with as well. So it's really great to share your own information so that others can benefit. I'm sure that most of you listening here have stumbled across other teachers' websites in the past and found it really useful when they've shared some information about something that you need to know about. So today I want to talk about a few things. I want to talk about how do you start a website? Is it hard to start a website? Do you need to know how to do coding to run and start a website? And does it cost a lot of money? So I want to run through all of those things and also cover what the difference is between a blog and a regular website. Now, I'll actually start off with that question. Now, you would have heard the word blog and you would have heard the word website and in the past there was quite a distinct difference between the two. A regular website was more of a static place for information which didn't change very much and a blog, when blogs first came along and became popular, they were more of a changing website because it's like a news feed in reverse chronological order. So the author on a blog would actually publish information, articles or posts as they're called, and they appear in reverse chronological order with the most recent thing being at the top of the pile. Now, a lot of blogs started out as a place for people to share personal journeys. They were a bit like online journals and they've morphed over the years to really be a place to spread and share news about any information and any topic and really, I mean any topic at all. Now, the the lines over the years have really become blurred between blogs and in inverted commas, normal websites and really... Most websites that I visit today have a blog element as part of them. So most websites, you might not even realize that it's a blog and it will be obvious to you because on the first page, it, it will show this sort of reverse chronological order of information being published, or it may not be so obvious because maybe the blog section of the website is actually on a separate kind of area. Now that's my website. I've actually got one which is a WordPress site and WordPress is a blogging platform. It's a content management system but when you visit my website you may not realize at first that it is set up that way because the first page is static and to get to my blog you need to click on the link in the the menu bar up the top which says blog and it will take you to that area and it's just one section of my website. Now in terms of free and easy options and they really are easy to use um, the things have changed over the years. It's much, much easier nowadays to get started to set up your own website and get publishing and really you can do that very, very quickly and very easily. Now, there are a number of different platforms which will allow you to set up your own website for free and I'm going to just name a few of them today. There's really hundreds of options out there but the ones that are the most popular and most simple to use that I've had some experience with uh, things like Weebly. So Weebly is one of the options. Wix, W-I-X, is another option. And WordPress.com is another one. They all start with W. I don't know why, but there you go. Wix, Weebly and website are fantastic options. Now, they are all set up to really help you out and you don't need to know any coding to use these websites. You can go there, you can set up your free account and you can get started really pretty quickly. There's another one called Squarespace. I haven't used that myself, but I understand that is also really simple and easy to use as well. And if you are using the Google suite of tools at your school, you may also want to look at Google Sites as an option because you already have access to that tool and you might consider that, especially if you're gonna work with students setting up their own websites as well. So as I mentioned, you'll go to one of these options, you can set up your free account and they will guide you through the steps essentially to set up your website. Um, you need, in my, you know, I'll, I'll give you a little tip in that it's really good before you start setting up your website if you gather together some things, some content, which is going to go on that website. If you think about any website that you visit, uh, everything that you see on each page is content. So there's text, which would be text about the person who runs the website or about the website itself, or it might be blog post text. 
There's also a lot of images everywhere. And so if you can gather some of these things ahead of time, it's just going to make, up, make your setup of the website quicker and easier because you've got it all there handy. Now, the benefits of using these free options is there's a simple interface to use. So it's really straightforward. They're easy to set up and use. And someone else kind of takes care of looking after your website for you. And I'll get a little bit more into that in a moment. Now, the drawbacks of using these free options are that you have less flexibility and less control and some limitations involved with the way that you use the website and what you can do with it. Now, those limitations and the lack of flexibility and control may not be an issue to you and it really depends what type of website you want to set up and particularly what your long-term goals are. So I'm going to talk about the other option, which is the not free option, so paid option. Still really easy to use, but I want to talk about why you might go with a paid option either straight away or even down the track. And you can always set up the free option first of all and change over to one of the paid options down the track if you're not sure which one to do. That can be a great way to go. So the other option, which is not free but still easy, is to do things a little bit differently. And now, and I'll talk a little bit about why would you choose this option in the first place. Now, if you are a business or you're thinking of starting a website with a long-term view of it becoming a business, and it may not start that way, but if down the track you think it might become a business, um, an example of this might be, Let's say you are running some professional development workshops yourself and you start a website out which is kind of your online home where people can find more information about you and the types of workshops that you run. Now down the track, you may discover or decide that you want to start running online courses. So maybe video versions of the in-person workshops that you've been running and you might want to sell those from your website. Now, if you want to do that down the track, having the paid website option where you're paying a little bit of money to set things up will give you more flexibility with that long-term sort of view or aim to monetize your site in some way. The paid options are like an upgraded version of the free ones. And you can, as I mentioned before, usually upgrade if you set up a free version of your website, you can usually upgrade to this paid option and then you end up with more control over the way your site looks, the functionality, what you can do and you'll have much more flexibility. And the bottom line with this one is that if you go the paid route, you will actually own your property, own your website property yourself. It's not living on someone else's property. Now, I'll give you a couple of analogies so that we can clearly understand the difference between the free option and the paid one. And basically, the free option, um, I'm going to talk real estate for a moment. So, the free option is, is a, as if you're renting a house, you can't change the wall colour, and that, that property is on someone else's land. So, every, someone else owns all of it, really, and you're just kind of borrowing things to have your website in existence. Now, the paid options are where you purchase your own block of land. Now, this is website hosting, if I relate it back to web, web design. You purchase your own block of land, which is the hosting. You purchase your own custom address for that place, and that's the domain name, which is the web address. So for me, mine is midnightmusic.com.au. I actually own that domain, which means that nobody else can use it. And I also build my own custom-made house on that land with that custom address and that's the website part and when you do it that way you can really do anything you like you've got a lot more flexibility it really does not cost a lot when you're starting out because you will have a, a website which doesn't have millions and millions of people visiting it all the time and basically all you'll need to pay for is the domain name so that's the address and hosting and that's also a low cost. And really, that's all. Then there are some optional other things that you might pay for, but you really don't need to. So the domain name cost, uh, if you want to register your own domain name so that you own it and nobody else um, owns it, that's you know really a low cost. It's less than $20, usually around $10 or so. I just purchased one today for $11 a year. And then you renew that each year. And it's a little bit cheaper if you pay for two years up front or five years up front. 
the hosting side of things starts out less than $10 a month and it really depends who you go for uh, go with for hosting. But basically it's a low cost, less than $10, $10 a month. And if your website really grows over time, that's something you can upgrade later on. If I was starting out today and I wasn't sure quite where I wanted to go with this, I would go with the free option. I think it's the best thing to do as a starting point if you're really not sure. Now, in terms of how you add content to your website, whether it's free or paid, there are just a few basic skills that you need to know. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no coding involved with this. So in the very early days, yes, you did need to know coding and it was a lot more difficult. Um, basically, in the very early days, there were two distinct views of your website. There was the back end view and then the front facing view, which is what everybody sees when they visit your website. Now, those two things were vastly different. So the back end of your website and the front facing one, completely different. So you would work in one and save your changes and then visit your website and see if it looked okay. You would find images were all out of place or the text looked weird. You'd go back to the back end view, you'd make some changes there and then you would go back and visit it again and see if it looked better. And I started out not when it was, you know, too bad, but by when I started out with my website, which was 2008, I think, things were a lot more difficult than they are nowadays even. There's even been quite some changes in the last few years. Nowadays, they've really made it super simple for you and they've taken away a lot of the need to kind of see two different versions of your website. So the back end view of your website now, if you go with one of those options I mentioned, Wix or Weebly or WordPress.com, there is a back end view still and a front end view, but they're a lot more similar than they used to be. And they, the editing view of your web page that you might be working on or the blog post that you might be working on is much more similar to working in a Word document nowadays than it used to be. So really the skills that you need to know to put anything on your website is how to write text, how to add images, how to embed videos and how to embed audio. They are really the only things that you need to know and you won't even need all of those all the time. The main two things are writing text and adding images. And both of those things are really, really similar to the way you work in a Word document or a Google document. The biggest thing you need to remember when you're adding anything to your web page or blog post is that in, after any change that you've made, you need to find the update or the save button or save draft button or something on that page in order to make sure those changes are actually retained. I have a number of times navigated away from the page that I've been working on without remembering to save and you will you will lose those changes that you just made. So I say frequently now it's a much better life if you do that and you will have less tears in the long run. Now, when you're working on a website, if it's one that's kind of one of those blogging platforms, content management systems, there are just a couple of things you need to know about the setup or structure of your site. The main one being that there are a couple of types of different pages on your website. So one type is called a page and those ones are more static. So basically that's the place where on my website I have an about page or a start here page. I have a page about workshops. Um, I have a page about joining my community. All of those are known as pages in my back end view of my website. Now, the other type of thing that I can do is create a post. And this is the, the area where I have a blog area and this is where I publish articles. So a post ends up appearing in the blog feed and that's where I publish articles about music technology related topics. So it might be how to use Padlet in the classroom or how to use GarageBand or how to use Sibelius and so on. And really that's about it. Um, I can assure you that it's not as daunting or as hard as it seems, but the only way you're going to find out that it's not too bad is actually to have a go. <laughs> and this is where, you know, trying out one of those free options is a great thing. Um, particularly if you've got access, as I said, to the Google Apps for Education, you can click set up on one of those Google site options and just have a play with it. Um, there are a number of ways when you're editing your website that uh, basically, you know, you can work in a draft mode so that it's not visible to the world. And even if it is visible to the world, if you hit the publish button and it is visible to the world, 
Um, really no one's going to see your website or that page unless you're sharing the link around. It's not going to be accidentally found uh, most of the time. And, you know, people looking at it and going, oh my gosh, it's an incomplete page or it's got mistakes on it. Um, really, it's not going to be found unless you actually share it and promote it in some way by, you know, putting a link on Facebook or sharing it around that way. So don't worry too much about, you know, what things look like while you're setting it up. Uh, I had mine going for quite some time before I spread the word about it. And, you know, you kind of work in this kind of draft mode for a little while and, and it's okay. So I would love to know, do you have a website already? Have you had a go and not had much success with it or had a go and left it neglected for a while? I know I did that early on. Um, have you been thinking even about starting a website but thought maybe it was a really difficult thing? Would you like to share your ideas online? I'd love it if there were more music teachers sharing their ideas online. I think it's a great thing and it's um, it definitely helps everybody out there. And have you perhaps been thinking about getting your students to submit work digitally, so via a website of their own? can be a great, great way to get them to publish their own materials as well. If you have your own website, leave a comment under this podcast episode post. There's a, a place for comments and I'd love you to share your website link with me and I can check it out and perhaps share some of the, the ones that I come across in a future episode of the podcast. So that's it for today's show. If you'd like more help with using technology, I'd love you to come and join me inside the Midnight Music community. It's an online space for music teachers who want to know more about technology through online courses and video tutorials and lesson plans and so on. For more information about the Midnight Music community and a special offer for podcast listeners, you can go to midnightmusic.com.au forward slash podcast offer. The Music Tech Teacher podcast is hosted by me, Katie Wardrobe. You can find more information and links from today's episode at midnightmusic.com.au forward slash 32. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next time.